Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word, the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 23, Luke 23. We're looking at Luke's life of Christ, and today we see the reaction to the death of Christ on the cross by some of the immediate eyewitnesses. Luke 23 and 47, Luke 23, verse 47. So when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site, seeing what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. But all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. So the Lord wasn't dying uh, completely alone. There were people around. Now, there wasn't really any palpable comfort for the Lord on the cross, that he was there suffering and the worst of the cross, suffering and dying for our sin, happened in complete darkness, that that miraculous veiling of the sun, where there was darkness over the whole earth from noon till 3 p.m., was not only an indication of the holy and awful judgment that was going to befall the sun, but it also shielded uh, the eyes of the people from that holy transaction, where heaven's love and heaven's justice met, uh, to paraphrase a hymn. Here, the son of God's love became the Lamb of God, taking away the sin of the world. And that was a holy thing that was happening. That was judgment such that humanity cannot fathom and vulgar eyes wouldn't be permitted to behold. So as the Lord was in that darkness, he was truly alone. He describes hell and the lake of fire as outer darkness. He talks about people being cast out of the kingdom into outer darkness uh, who haven't repented and believed on him. And the Lord Jesus himself experienced that outer darkness. Now, Solomon said, Lord, thou hast said that thou would dwell in the thick darkness. There's a sense in which God puts the darkling veil between us and him. We can't see God in all of his holy glory. And so on the cross, when the Lord Jesus died for our sins, we could not see what was going on there. We couldn't see that transpiring where the Lord, who was the holy and righteous one, was made sin for us. He became that perfect sin offering who was treated like sin itself. And the wrath of God was poured out in unmitigated fury on him. He drank that cup to its utter dregs. And so there was darkness over the whole land from noon till 3 p.m. Now the people that were around obviously saw these things. They wouldn't have seen the temple uh, being torn from top to bottom, but word of that would have got around later, no doubt. But they would have seen the great darkness. They would have seen the Lord die with a triumphant shout, not dying with a whimper, not dying gasping for breath, dying as if he were absolutely in control of the situation, which in fact he was. He had power to lay down his life. He had power to take it up again. This commandment had he received of his father. He said, no man taketh it from me. And so the centurion, the chief officer who was presiding over the execution squad, he was visibly moved by what he had seen. He had undoubtedly seen many people crucified. He had probably been present at numerous ex executions and worked his way up through the ranks uh, till he was in charge of the whole affair. But he never saw someone die like this, and it never moved him to glorify God. In other words, to give God glory, saying, certainly this was a righteous man. Now, if we compare what the other Gospels say about this centurion's confession, he said, surely this was a righteous man. Surely this is the Son of God. So I believe that this is a confession of faith, that this man came to know who the Lord Jesus Christ was. And when you go to the cross and you stand there by faith, and you see this man who never did anything wrong, who always did everything right, who was perfect, morally unblemished, who kept the law of God superlatively, who lived a life unlike any other, whose words still evoke wonder and change lives the world over. You say, truly, this was a righteous man. There was never a one who loved righteousness and hated lawlessness like the Lord Jesus Christ. This was a man who had everything in order. His life was subject to the will of his Father in heaven, and he lived that life that is the beautiful life, the life that pleases God. 
and a life that no one before or since has perfectly lived. So to confess him as a righteous man, it's certainly true. Not only was this not, uh, not only was this a miscarriage of justice, not only could he say, oh, the courts really made a mistake here. Oh, this was a travesty. Uh, this wasn't carrying forth anything to do with justice. This had nothing to do with truth and with human guilt. Because here was a guiltless man. Here was the innocent one who was perfectly righteous, who died for others, who died for the guilty. This was a righteous man. The thief on the cross would say, this man has done nothing amiss. He's done nothing wrong. But the centurion would go farther and say, he was a righteous man. And as the other gospels say, he was the son of God. So he recognized this person wasn't from this world. This person came forth from the Father. This person was the Savior. This was God coming down amongst men in the person of his Son and doing a work that humanity could not do. So even in that awful scene of the cross where there was so much depravity and dissipation and evil that there the Lord reaches down into that darkness as it were and even in the moment of his death he saves people. He saves this centurion. He leads him uh, to this great confession of faith, this recognition that this was a perfect man who wasn't dying for himself. This was the Son of God who was coming to die for others, to die for me. Undoubtedly, uh, we could say that. <clears throat> and yet, not only the centurion, but we read about this multitude, this crowd that was around there. And they had been seeing what had been done. So here were these people that were eyewitnesses. They were perhaps curiosity seekers. Maybe they were just interested in seeing what happens to this public figure, this celebrity. Maybe some of them had heard the Lord Jesus teach and preach when he was in the temple. Or maybe they heard him when he was up in Galilee and things like the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain or whatever the case may be. Uh, they certainly heard about the Lord Jesus as he was entering in for the last time just a few days before. Matthew 21 says that the whole city was moved about him. So people were talking about the Lord Jesus, talking about him, wondering if he was the Christ. And maybe some had already believed that he was the Christ. There were believers at the cross. Mary had been there earlier, his earthly mother. John, his beloved disciple who was entrusted with her was there as well. And uh, other believing ladies, uh, like Mary, the wife of Cleopas, who was there too. So there were believers interspersed there. And there were rulers like Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, people that were politicians in the council involved with the Sanhedrin. And they were nearby as well. So this crowd, no doubt, was multifaceted. It was composed of different people, maybe even a mixed multitude of believers and unbelievers. But the reaction of the crowd was in keeping with what they had seen. They beat their breasts. Now that was, in the ancient Near East, a sign of grief, a sign of um, a deep, profound emotion, we might say. And so these people, in a sense, were looking at the way this man died and saying, wow, you know, this is different. This is not what we were expecting. This is not like the death of anybody else we've seen. This is not even like other executions that we may have seen before. This is different. And maybe seeing the way he died, maybe some of them were led to think the same thing that the centurion thought. This was a righteous man. He wasn't worthy of dying this way. This shouldn't have happened. This is wrong. Or maybe they were even brought to see, this is the Son of God who died for me. The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This explains Psalm 22 and Psalm 69 and Isaiah 53 and many other passages of Scripture. That the Lord was dying to save others. That the Lord gave his life as a ransom for many. That he would taste death for every man, as Hebrews 2 says. And so they beat on their breasts. But you know... Some people can come and have an emotional reaction to Jesus. They can hear about how he died. They can hear about his sufferings. They can hear about the physical torment of the cross. And that can move them to a certain extent. 
but we can't just let it rest with emotion. We have to go on and repent of our sin. See that we're the sinner for whom Christ died. See that it was not for crimes he had done he groaned upon the tree, but it was amazing pity, love, a grace unknown in love beyond degree as the Lord died for us at the cross, that he was dying for me, dying for you. And we have to say, he's right about me. I deserve to hang on that cross and I deserve to be cast into hell. I, he doesn't deserve it. He's the righteous son of God. He's the one who is going to come and rule over the kingdom of God one day as king of kings of Lord and Lord of Lords. And now I want to bow to him and acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. I want him to come in and save me. I want him to be in charge of my life. I've wrecked my life. I've made a mess of my life. I've hurt others. I've said things I shouldn't. I've done things I shouldn't. I've thought things I shouldn't. And I still do. And I need a Savior. I need the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord says that he will save the one that comes unto him. That if we cast ourselves on him and we say, like others said before, we think of that tax collector who said, Lord, be merciful, be propitious to me, a sinner. Show me your grace based on sacrifice, that grace that flows out of the death of Christ, that grace that comes to us and assures us it's real and powerful and can transform and save us because the Lord Jesus has risen from the dead. And because he lives, we shall live also. The believer can know, I will rise again. Or if he comes while I'm alive and remain, I will be caught up to meet him in the air. I will be transformed. I will be in the Father's house. Because the Lord Jesus has said and done it. Friends, the Lord Jesus did everything that the Bible says Messiah would do at his first coming. And the Lord Jesus is going to do everything as well regarding the second coming. And so we, it behooves us to be ready. That if the Lord were to come today, would we be happy about that? Now, do we look at his death and are we saying, oh, it was an awful thing. And in a sense, we beat our breast. We say, how terrible, such ugly things happen in our world a miscarriage of justice but a lot of these people returned and we don't know that they ever repented some of them maybe did some of them maybe believed in the book of acts under the preaching of the apostles it could very well be many priests became obedient to the faith Acts says so perhaps some of those who were on duty even when the temple was torn from top to bottom we don't know but we need to respond to what the Lord Jesus does. If he's convicting us of our sin and of the reality of who he is, that we need to bow the knee and say, my Lord and my God, save me a sinner. We need to do that and to do it today. But among that crowd, verse 49 says, all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. So again, there were eyewitnesses. Christianity is based in history. And people, if they wanted to know the details of the crucifixion and the details of his burial and the details of the subsequent resurrection, as Luke will show us, he appeared to many. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the 12. He appeared to 500 brothers at once, 1 Corinthians 15 says. He appeared to James. And last of all, he appeared to me as one born out of due time. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul speaking of himself. He had interaction with the risen Christ. He met the risen Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it transformed him. It changed his life. He went from being the chief of sinners to being a saint, a set apart one in Christ Jesus, a sinner saved by grace who becomes a believer, who is seen not dead in trespasses and sins any longer, but seen in Christ and being in Christ, seen as secure, forgiven, justified that is declared righteous and sanctified made holy by the saving work of the Lord Jesus Christ well the Lord offers you the same thing he did to them and you don't have to stand afar off you don't have to keep your distance from the Lord Jesus you might say oh but if you knew my sins if you knew what I've done if you knew what I'm like if you knew my failures and my faults and the character flaws I have if you knew how twisted and perverted my heart is how bad and darkened my mind is. You wouldn't say, come near to Christ. He wouldn't want the likes of me. Well, friend, you're no different than any one of us. Even we who've grown up in Christian homes and heard the gospel from day one and been well acquainted with the scriptures, we've got evil hearts. The heart 
is desperately wicked, Jeremiah the prophet said. Who can know it? Well, the Lord knows it. He knows its depths. And he is willing to save us in spite of our sin. So come to the Lord Jesus today. And if you are already a believer, tell somebody else about what the Lord has done. And rejoice, because this one who died for us also rose again for us. And he ascended to heaven, leading captivity captive and giving gifts to men. And he's coming again. So the Lord is not a non-factor. He's still very active in the world. He's saving people by his grace. And one day he's going to come to judge the world. So make sure you're ready. Make sure you're looking forward to seeing the Savior. And you can know that today if you'll call out to him to save you and make you his own. I hope you'll do that. Thank you for listening. Have a good day.